Good morning. How's everybody doing? Are you ready to worship Jesus? All right, let's stand together. Welcome to Exalt. We're so glad you're here. We serve a God who is amazing, who loves you. He takes the broken things and he puts them back together again. He takes the dead things and turns them to life. Amen? That's the kind of God we serve and that's who we are going to worship. We're going to worship Jesus. Here we go. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame And who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you and I was breathing but not alive oh. and all my failures I tried to hide it was my turn till I made you yes, you called my name and I Jesus in this place, guys. Absolutely. Well, welcome in. My name's Tommy. I'm one of the pastors here at Exalt Church, and it is so awesome to have you all with us 
this morning. If you're a first time guest as you came in, I'm sure you got a worship packet and inside it is a Let's Connect card. If you can fill this out during service, we just wanna thank you for trusting us with your time. If you are new here, there are three things you can expect. You may have woke up this morning and said, I don't know what to expect. You can expect God in this place. Here's the thing, we don't have time for gimmicks or shows. It's our hope and it is our prayer that you have a true encounter with the living God. At Exalt, you can expect honesty that we're gonna tell you the truth. We're gonna tell you the truth from the word of God and you can expect love in this place. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. This morning, we're gonna make it real easy for you. Just, just join us in this awesome worship as we lift up the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Let's lift up the name of Jesus, church. try this again, but that's all right. God is good. Amen. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. My chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now you're faithful. He's faithful then and he's faithful now. Amen.
Aren't you thankful for Jesus? Amen. Can you give him praise? Yes. Thank you, Lord. We praise your holy name. Turn to somebody beside you and tell them Jesus loves you. Amen. And you look good. And be honest. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. God is so holy. It took me a moment to get myself together back there. Amen. Loving praise and worship. I am so grateful to be here on this morning. Good morning, Exalt family. And good morning to all of you who chose to spend your worship time with us on today. When you arrived on this morning, you received a connect card. You received this ministry packet, and in that packet is this card. If you are worshiping with us on this morning as a guest, we ask that you would please take a few moments to fill out that card, and please place it in one of our kiosks as you're leaving on this morning. Or you can scan our QR code and go online to fill out that information. Calling all exalt kids. That is kindergarten through fifth grade. You are dismissed. Your wonderful team leaders back there in the red shirts are waiting to escort you to your classrooms. Have a wonderful time. Parents, if you have not registered your child on this morning, it is not too late. You can simply follow the little ones and they will lead you to our registration table. Listen, I had a notice that we are having a special delivery here on February 4th at the huddle at 10 a.m. There is a special delivery, and you can all be a part of that. If you would like to show your appreciation to our wonderful pastors, and we have four of them who make things look easy around there and we around here, and we know that it isn't, but they do a great job in serving God. And so we want to show our appreciation to them. And if you would like to participate in that, you can simply write an encouraging card or um, if you would like to give a monetary gift of love you can do that as well we have cards out in the hallway please make sure you pick one up and write your note in there or put anything in there that you would like and bring it back on next week. We have four mailboxes out there in the hallway, one for each of our four pastors. We want you to participate in showing them your appreciation. Just simply put your gift in the mailboxes. On February 4th, 10 15 a.m we will pre be presenting those gifts to each of the pastors so come out a little early and help us in showing our appreciation you'll love it and we will be glad to see you february 4th at 10 15 a.m we have a lot of announcements on this morning our student ministry teens where are you that is sixth through 12th grade. You all are dismissed at this time. Your small group leaders are waiting to escort you to your classrooms. And since we are talking about small groups, that packet that you received on this morning inside, there is an insert that has a listing of our upcoming winter semester small groups. On there, if you see any of the groups that you might want to participate in, simply check that group off. And at the end of service, place that list in one of our kiosks in the hallway. That way we know exactly what group you are looking to be a part of. We are looking forward to seeing you in those semester groups. Please take time to put those in the kiosk. We're still talking about 
small groups around here. We love fellowshipping and getting together. Men, the breakfast is back. Calling all men, coming this Saturday, this coming Saturday, January 27th, they will be meeting at the Golden Corral um, on Volvo Parkway in Chesapeake. You do not want to miss it. They get their souls fed as well as their stomachs. That breakfast will begin at 7 a.m. Don't miss it. They'll be there waiting for you. Now listen, you all see that we have so many easy ways to give around here. We don't make it hard at all. So we ask that you would simply uh, do one of those. Just take one of those that you see there and give any way that you decide to do. We are not um, hungry around here for your money, but we know that, that takes, it takes that to make things work. And we appreciate however you decide to give, we thank you for partnering with Exalt Church. Now, let's get out your Bibles, let's get out our notes, and get ready for what we all came for as we welcome our lead pastor to come back and pick up where we left off in the study of Colossians. Amen. Thank you, Miss D. Can you give it up for Miss D? Isn't she awesome? Great. Why don't you guys stand with me? And I want to apologize uh, from the very beginning. I haven't preached for about four weeks, so I am wound up. So I hope you've brought your, uh, your, your seatbelt buckle, and you're going to buckle up a little bit, and we are going to rock and roll in just a few moments. And so if you don't know who I am, my name is Roger Pate. I have the joy and the privilege of serving as the lead servant here, the lead pastor at Exalt Church, and what a great congregation to serve. Now, we are going to continue our series on the book of Colossians, and I want to encourage you if you ever miss a week, it's all right. Come on back because each message is going to be a standalone message that will be applicable to your life. And so if you miss one, don't hesitate to come back. You will still receive something from it. Today we're going to talk about Paul's view of the ministry. And you may be saying, Pastor, why would you talk about ministry to a group of educators, to a group of construction workers, to a group of sailors, wives, and IT geeks? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's why. Because as we go through the books of the Bible, book by book, verse by verse, one of the beautiful things is when a subject comes up, we deal with that subject as it comes up. And I love that as a pastor because then you can't accuse me of picking on you when I pick up a subject I really don't want to deal with. And so sometimes I will thumb ahead and see where we're going, and I'll say, Laura Pate, in about four weeks, it is going to be some hard plowing in about four weeks. And so we're going to talk about Paul's view of ministry because it comes up in our text today. Also, we're going to talk about it for a spiritual reason, and that is because I believe and teach that every Christian, every believer, every follower of Christ is a missionary and a minister. That doesn't mean that you're called to be a pastor or a vocational pastor like I am, but all of you are called to be ministers and missionaries spreading the gospel in your families, in your neighborhoods, and also through your vocations. If you're laying carpet, you're a minister of laying carpet for the glory of God. And God's going to give you a chance to share the gospel in that. Now, the Protestants who broke away from the Catholics, uh, one of the biggest reasons why Protestants broke away from Catholics was because of something called the priesthood of all believers. We believe and teach that each one of you are priests. You're not pastors, all of you, but each one of you are priests. What does that mean? You can go directly to God and talk to God directly. Now, let me, before we jump on this, let me say this. That uh, this was a really hard passage to outline. Have you ever read the Apostle Paul and you think to yourself, what is that dude saying? Right? You're in good company. The Apostle Peter said of Paul's writings, said this guy writes stuff and he is hard to 
understand. Here is why. The Apostle Paul was the very first rabbit chaser of the preachers. Because, and, and that's who I like to be after, because he'll make a subject and he'll talk and then he'll chase a rabbit for four chapters and then get back to his original point. He, he does this thing called stream of consciousness. And he just kind of takes whatever he's saying like spaghetti and he throws it against the kitchen wall and what sticks, sticks. And so when I was preparing the message this week, uh, usually I'm done by 5 o'clock on Monday night. I didn't get done until about 4 o'clock on Wednesday, okay? Because I'm saying, Apostle Paul, man, what are you doing? I can't even outline you here, man. Help me out. So here's what we're going to do today. I'm going to make it really simple for you. Have you ever gone uh, on vacation somewhere and you hired a carriage ride through New York City or have you ever taken a bus tour of a city and you get in that bus and the bus tour guide just points out, hey, look over here, look at this house, look at this cemetery here, look at this tree right here. Over here, this happened. And as he points stuff out, you realize some of the things really aren't related, but when you get at the end of the tour, you're going, yeah, that was pretty informational. I got something out of that, although not everything was connected. Well, that's going to be today's message. I'm going to make, try to connect it as good as I can, and as best I can, but at the end, if it doesn't connect, just treat us like we're on a bus. And I am your bus driver. Oh, God bless you if you're in a car with me, guys. <laughs> and you know what they've done in Chesapeake? They brought speed cameras into Chesapeake. All right? They're not fighting fair. I've already got one. All right? <laughs> They're not fighting fair. So have you. You're as guilty as I am, right? It's not because I was speeding, it's because the camera wasn't calibrated correctly, right? <laughs> Forgive me for lying, church, on Sunday morning. But you're, you're going to be in my bus. You're going to be in the gospel bus with me today. And we're going to drive along through this passage, and I'm going to point out a few things along the way that Paul points out. Book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 24. Paul writing says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. Verse 27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Him we proclaim, warning everyone. Look at someone and say, warning, warning, Will Robinson. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. The word of the Lord, thanks be to God, you may be seated. Amen. So we're on the bus, guys, and the first thing I want to point out to you is, number one, the source of the ministry. Look at verse 25. Paul says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. First of all, that is what a pastor should be doing. He should be making the word of God fully known. That's why about a year and a half ago, I made a shift and realized the way I was teaching and preaching uh, wasn't working. Why? Because people weren't getting the Bible and learning the Bible. We were, we were kind of doing a machine gun shot 
Gun style. Pull a verse from here, pull a verse from context over here, pull a verse over here. And I realized that people weren't really understanding the Bible. And so we shifted and said, we're going to start taking a book at a time, and we're going to work through those books to establish people in the Bible. Why? Because we want to make the Word of God fully known. And I don't know about you, but I have my favorite parts of the Bible, and numbers isn't it. Leviticus isn't it, all right? And there are some of those passages I love. I love the passages that talk about how victorious we are and and how joyous we are. I don't like the passages that talk about suffering that we're going to talk about in a few moments. And so if I am like you and you're like me, it's easy for pastors on a Sunday who want to build a crowd and get people to come to skip over those parts that aren't as popular, to skip over those parts that we don't really like. And so Paul says, here I became a minister. Listen carefully. Paul did not choose to become a minister. Paul was not called by mama. Paul was not called by his pastor. Paul didn't decide one day, oh, I want to be a pastor. I want to be an apostle. I want to be a preacher. No, to become a minister means you've got to be called to be a minister. And if you're called by mama, when the hard times comes as a pastor, you'll give up and you'll quit. If you chose yourself to be a pastor, when the hard times come, you will give up and you will quit because the pressure is so intense that you won't be able to go to the fires and the flame of that. But Paul became a minister. Who was Paul? Paul was this guy who formerly was known as Saul, and he hated Christians. He hated the church. He persecuted the church. He went after the church, and on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and to persecute them, he had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus knocked him to the ground. Wow. He gave him a holy field or a holy uh, Mike Tyson punch. He didn't bite his ear. He just knocked him out, okay? And with the punch, there is Paul on the ground. And Jesus says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? God made him an apostle. God made him a minister. Now, I love the ESV translation. That's my favorite translation. However, the word minister here is better translated the way the NIV translates it. It's better translated, I became a servant. You see, Paul didn't have this attitude that he was some dignitary. Paul didn't have this attitude that he was somebody special. Paul didn't have this attitude that he was someone from the home office that you better listen to. Paul did not believe that ministry and the church and spiritualities was climbing ladders. Paul believed that the church and the ministry and being a follower of Christ isn't climbing a ladder, but it's being crucified to a cross. And we want to teach that here at Exalt Church. We, we don't want to be climbing up ladders. We, we want to crucify our, ourselves upon a cross. And we want to die to our dreams and our wishes. And we want His will to be done and His kingdom to come. And for Him to increase and for us to decrease. And so Paul says, I became a servant according to the stewardship from God. That, that, that word stewardship is an interesting word. That word in our Greek language, we get our English word from it called economy. And so we get the word economy from the word stewardship. And here's what it means. To be a steward means that I manage somebody else's property. I manage somebody else's stuff. I manage somebody else's household. And if we can get that into our hearts... That as followers of Jesus Christ, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, King Jesus, if we can get it into our minds that we own nothing. But we're managers for a short time of his household. 
That means my body isn't mine, so I can't do whatever I want to with my body because as a follower of Jesus, it's his. Now listen carefully. As an American, you can do whatever you want to with your body. As an American, you can live pretty much any way you want to as an American, and in this libertarian society, you can do it. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, that puts boundaries upon your life. And we all understand boundaries. We say we don't like boundaries, but you sports fans, none of you would watch a sport without boundaries. Think about it. You go, you go bowling, and I am not a real good bowler. I'm really good at bowling on the Atari game system from the 1980s, however. But if you go bowling, I believe there is something called, is it called alleys on the sides, gutters on the side here? Why? Because if you get off the lane and you get into the gutter, you don't score. You can't win. How would it be if you were watching that Packers game last night against the 49ers and everybody just did whatever they wanted to do? And they just grabbed the ball and run like crazy. Now, I'll admit to you, there are times I wish they would be less stringent and quit replaying the tape and just let them play sometimes, right? Especially when it goes against my team, all right? But here is the fact. He says, We are stewards, and so my body is his, my life is his, my thoughts are his. This is his church. I try not to call Exalt Church my church. Now, sometimes I do it lovingly and say the church I pastor and my folks and my church, but but I, I don't view that as an ownership. I may say it in a term of endearment, but I realize that Exalt is God's church. And so I have a fear and a trembling and a sense of awe at how I lead and how I preach and what I do. Why? Because you're His. And I realize there'll be a day that when this life is past and I will stand in eternity and God will look at me, specifically Jesus Christ, because the Father has delegated judgment to the Son. So the one who died for us will be the one who judges us. That's why it's so powerful. If you reject what he did upon the cross, now you stand before the one you rejected, and the one you rejected is the one that is going to judge you and look at your life and say, what have you done with what I have given you? And so our lives, our time, our talents, our abilities, your children aren't even yours. My dog isn't even mine. It's God's. My home isn't even mine. It's his. And praise God for our homes and praise God for wives. But you know what? I got to be careful how I treat my bride because as I call her my bride, first of all, she is his daughter. And the Bible says to us men, the Bible says to us husbands, he says, be careful how you treat your wife, because if you grieve her, God says, I will not answer your prayers. Wow. Every lady should have said, amen, pastor, preach it. That was your chance. Let me back up. Beep, 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 beep. Listen, if you treat her wrongly, God is not going to hear your prayers. And sometimes your prayers are hindered because of the way you've treated her. Why? Because God wants to remind... Thank you, Danny Klepper. (laughs) Tony, treat her right, buddy. Treat her right. Because here's what's going to happen. God is reminding us, she, Roger Pate, isn't your property. She is not your chattel. This is not 1776, all right? She is God's creation. She is God's masterpiece. And I better respect her and love her and enjoy her and treat her, first of all, like his creation and like his daughter. And I know some of you dads, Steve Watts back over here, I know some of you dads and how you're protective of your kiddos, right? You're protective. Why? Because you don't want some bum coming up and treating your daughter the way she shouldn't be treated. Can I have an amen? Amen. And so we are stewardships. That is not in the notes, anywhere in the notes. But we are stewards of everything that God has given us. And he says, I'm a steward. I'm a servant for you. You catch that? For 
you. Contrary to popular teaching today, the spiritual gifts that God has given you are not for your own goosebumps and your own edification and to make you feel good. When God gives you a talent, God gives you an ability, God gives you a spiritual gift, it's to be a blessing to other people. Now that brings us to the next site on our bus tour. Number two, I want you to look over here. I want you to see the suffering of the ministry. Look at verse 24. Paul says, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. What was The Apostle Paul, what was his reaction to suffering? What was his reaction to being in jail again? What was his reaction to realize that Nero is going to execute him shortly? His reaction and his posture was, I rejoice in my suffering. Why did Paul rejoice in his suffering? It all comes down to the point of view or the perspective of the Apostle Paul. Oftentimes, we see this life through our own vantage point and our own perspective. And if we could just pull back 10,000 feet and attempt to get the vision of God and get the point of view of God, the way we view life may change drastically. You've heard me say it many times. It's like being at the parade and you're sitting in your lawn chair in the parade and your point of view is you can only see what is in front of you. Maybe a little that's behind you, maybe a little that is coming uh, in front of you, but you see pretty much what is here right now. But when you have the view of the blimp or the view of the drone, let's come into 2020 something, all right? You have the view of that drone, that drone sees you the beginning of the parade and the end of the parade, every turn along the parade, every detail, every obstruction, and that is God's view. God has a view of your before you were here, while you're here, what's ahead, and what's to come. And God brings things into our lives, and God brings challenges into our lives, and we want to say, why God? I don't understand God. And that is because you have limited point of view. You only see this much. You only see this little. But if you were to look at eternity, you would see all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And what is that calling? What is that purpose? If you continue reading that verse, it says to conform you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So every suffering, every hardship is to make us mature and to make us like Jesus Christ. Why did Paul rejoice? Because, listen carefully, Paul had a theology. If you're taking notes, write this down. Paul had a theology of suffering. The American church does not have a theology of suffering. Why? Because most of our teachers, most of our preachers on the radio and television and online have a potless view of preaching, and they only tell you the popular positive verses from Scripture that make you feel good. So they'll say, come to Jesus and everything will be joyful. Come to Jesus and everything will be great. Come to Jesus and you'll have joy unspeakable, full of glory. Woo! Amen. (laughs) Did you notice that when Jesus called people to follow him, he never said, hey, follow me. It's going to be like we're at Bush Gardens on a wonderful roller coaster. It's going to be fun. Woo! No, Jesus says, follow me. And they will take everything from you. Follow me and they will abuse you and they will curse you and they will persecute you and they'll revile you and some of you they may even kill. Wow. 
So when Paul said yes to Jesus, he understood it may cost me everything. And so he had this perspective that suffering was going to be expected. That suffering was going to be normal. And why is this important? Because whenever we suffer, here is the first question unbelievers and believers ask. Why? Why? And we have dealt with that in depth on why we suffer. I've got two messages online. You can go look it up on our website about suffering in the questions series. You can also grab a booklet for free on our resource table on why does God allow suffering. That will help you some. But, but I, I want to go a different direction for a moment. I, I think the reason why that we don't like suffering and we question God's goodness when we suffer is because pulpits have not proclaimed that when you follow Jesus, you will suffer. We haven't preached that when you choose Jesus as your King and your Lord, that puts you in opposition to your own desires. That puts you in opposition to a culture that doesn't like Jesus. Oh, they like his miracles, they don't like his teaching. It puts us in opposition to a devil that wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. In fact, the Bible says, and these are not in your notes, but if you're taking notes, write it down and check me later. Matthew chapter 5 and verses 10 through 12 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted, this is Jesus speaking, for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil falsely on my account. You know I'm not a big fan of social media. But every now and then, I will get a troll that just loves to shred me. And it happens sometimes. Someone recently shredded me and said, I would never go to this man's church, and I encourage you not to go to his church, and and just began to rip me like crazy. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to jump right back on there and give her the what for. But I was more mature than that. I just unfriended her. Amen. That's what I did. And then I starved her with silence, and then I said... Praise God when all speak against you. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. So they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, let me give a disclaimer here. There are times I deserve criticism. There are times I am wrong and it's justified. And i got to say, you're right, baby, I was wrong. That happens about once every 10 years, okay? <laughs> about once every 10 years. I, I will, you're right, baby, I'm wrong. You know, you're right, friend, I'm wrong. But listen, listen. We don't celebrate and say, oh, praise God, I got a speeding ticket. Glory to God, I'm being persecuted for Jesus. No, I have a lead foot. It was my fault, and Chesapeake was correct. You know you're wrong when years ago, Laura and I were newly married, and the officer pulled me over in Red Mill, and he leans his head into my car, and he looks at Laura, and he says, tell him to slow down. (laughs) And Laura goes, I'm trying. I'm trying, officer. And he goes, Rod, you ever have an officer call you by a nickname? (laughs) Rod. Slow down. So I don't celebrate and say, wow, I'm paying this fine. Oh, it's, it's because I'm suffering for Jesus. But when you're doing the work of God and you're doing the work of Jesus for the purpose of Jesus and they criticize you or they judge their motives and they're going to, just rejoice. Because you can fight it and you may win with the trolls on social media, but the reality is the troll you're fighting with is probably only a 14-year-old pre-puberty boy who has unlimited time to argue and say all kinds of things to you, and nobody's got time for that. You got really quiet because I said puberty. 
on a Sunday morning. I told you I haven't preached for three weeks, guys. Who knows what's going to come out today? So he says, rejoice in the sufferings. And the church of the New Testament, when they were persecuted, I remember a story where they took Peter, James, and John, and some of the others, and they said, don't speak about Jesus. And they, said, they beat them and said, if you keep talking about Jesus, we're going to throw you in prison. We're going to kill you. And they came out of there rejoicing because they counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus Christ. Peter says, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So why did Paul rejoice in sufferings? Because he was doing it for Jesus Christ. Doing it for Jesus Christ. And second of all, he also, let me, let me check my notes here. I want, I want to make sure I hit something here. And that is this. If you realize you're suffering for Jesus Christ, your perspective will change on everything. Paul never saw himself as a prisoner of Rome. Paul never saw himself as a prisoner of his circumstances. Paul saw himself as a servant of King Jesus and the will of Jesus Christ. And he knew that nothing was going to come into his life that wasn't filtered by the purpose and the plan and the love and the grace of God. And if I can realize that God is that great, that God is that sovereign, that God is that wonderful, that whatever God allows to come into my life has been filtered by his plan, has been filtered by his purpose, has been filtered by his love. Wow, then I can rejoice saying, God, I don't understand what you're doing. Your ways are not my way. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. But man, you are good. And I can't wait to see what you do with this. And what's powerful about that, if you will see it that way, then you will see your boss in a whole different light. Because now you realize you're not a victim to your boss's wishes and your boss's ideas and your boss's capriciousness. You can say, God, he's a tool in the hand of God. Use him to make me mature. Use him to grow me up. Use him for your purpose. And that's when a circumstance comes in your life and you don't like it. Instead of fighting against it, instead of wrestling against it, instead of struggling and fighting and toiling, you'll say, God, your will be done. Praise God. I trust you. Now, before you come up and you try to correct me after I preach today and say, never pray that, that pray God's will be done. I'm going to tell you that's the only way to pray because God's will is perfect and God's will is holy and God's will is good and God knows everything. So God, your will be done. I am never at a more faithful filled place than when I pray, God, your will be done. I get selfish when I pray my will because when I pray what I want, I always pray for my best. I always want the best for me. I pray for my football team. I want them to beat your football team. You got two parents at a little league game. You've got Daddy Johnny praying, let my boy strike him out because I want everyone to see what a jock my son is. And then on the other team, you got Mommy. Hey, please, Lord, let Junior hit a home run because I just want to show how good of a junior baseball player he is. Who's going to win in that scenario? Someone's going to lose, right? Why? Because we pray our will. We want what we want when we want it. And none of us pray for suffering. None of us pray for hardship. None of us pray for patience unless you're a doctor. Amen. No one prays for death unless you're a mortician. And then maybe you pray. I was talking to one mortician recently. He said, how's business? He says, business is really, really good. All right, I don't know how to pray for your business. I, I, I can't pray that your business prospers, dude. I, I, just, I just can't go there with you. So he rejoiced. Why? He rejoiced because he was suffering not for himself. He was suffering for Jesus. And then he rejoiced. Why? Because he was suffering for your sake. 
Paul said, I will suffer for the Gentiles to hear the gospel. I will suffer so that the universal church will hear the gospel. I will suffer. And here's what's amazing about that. Because Paul suffered. I have the New Testament that has the majority of the works by the Apostle Paul because he suffered and he rejoiced in his suffering. And he didn't sit down and say, I'm just mopey and sad. I'm just Eeyore and life is so bad. Why has God forgotten me? No, in the prison, he said, you know what? You're going to take a high caliber guy. You're going to take a hyper guy and you're going to put him in prison. What am I going to do? I'm going to take that energy. I'm going to channel it into something great and I'm going to begin to write my sermons, write my theology, write my doctrine, write the word of God, and I'm going to pass it along. And because Paul said, I rejoice in my sufferings. I have the book of Colossians and Philippians and Ephesians and most of my New Testament. Why? Because he said, I am suffering for Jesus and I'm suffering for people I have never even met. Thank God Paul suffered, and because he suffered, I am the beneficiary of all of his suffering. And right now, you understand this, mamas, when you were giving birth, you suffered. Just get this thing out of me. Amen. Can you call Pastor Roger, ask him to cast it out in the name of Jesus? You suffered. My poor mama bore me through July. She bore me through June. And she bore me through the mo most hottest month in Kansas, August. And about on day 25, I said, you know what? It's hot enough. I'm ready to come out. And, you know, here she carried that big over eight pound baby, you know, changing her body. I look fat, honey. I, I look bad, honey. I am miserable, honey. Won't this kid get out of here? And she suffered. And she suffered. And there came that curly headed baby boy, came out, and her suffering just began right then. <laughs> One time, Laura asked my mama, who was the mother of a deceased daughter and three boys, she said, Mama, how did you raise three hyper boys like Roger? Mama said, I smoked a whole lot. I smoked a lot. And she did. All right. And so here's the point. She suffered. You know what this is, Dad, when you want to buy the motorcycle. But instead... You choose to put it under because you want your kids to have something better in life than you did. So you pay for their private schooling, or you pray for their education, or you pay for their sports equipment. Why? Because you're going to suffer. Why? Because that's what adults do for other people. That's what mature Christians do. We sacrifice and we give. Why do we keep doing this year after year? Tear down, set up, tear down, set up. Why do we suffer? Because it's a greater call. It's a greater purpose. And we will benefit, but there are going to be generations that come behind us that will benefit from your suffering. Thank you for your suffering. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for carrying the burden in your body. Amen. Are you glad you guys came today? Yeah. Is it clear there is no way I'm going to get done with this message today? <laughs> H have you realized that yet? I warned you guys. Paul wasn't asking, what can I get out of it? Paul was asking, what can I put into it? I want to get deep for just a moment. And I want to draw your attention. I'm going to teach for just a moment. At that phrase, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. I, I want to slow down because some things are caught and some things are taught. And I want to make sure I teach this correctly. What does it mean that Paul, through his suffering, was filling up 
what was lacking in Jesus Christ's affliction. This has been a source of debate by theologians and pastors and commentators for years, and it's a source of much controversy. And I laid down in the text this week, and this is why it took me to Wednesday, because as I just mulled this over, and I studied it, and I researched it, and I dug into it, and I looked into the the ancient languages of what the words meant, and just buried myself in it, and got buried in the controversy. I think I can give you a, a biblical, balanced answer. First of all, when Paul says, I suffered and it was filling up what was lacking in Christ's affliction, make no mistake about it, he wasn't saying that the cross was not effective or efficacious. He was not saying that the cross was lacking something with regards to your salvation and your atonement. But here's what he's saying. When Paul was traveling and he was persecuting the church of Jesus Christ in the name of the Jewish leaders under the authority of Rome, when the Lord got his attention and knocked him to the ground, do you remember what the Lord said to him, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wait a minute. Jesus had already died. Jesus had already been buried. Jesus had already been risen, raised from the dead. Jesus had already ascended into heaven and is at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for the kings of this earth to become his kingdom. Why are you persecuting me? And here's the point. Whenever a persecutor, whenever an attacker of the church attacks a believer of Jesus Christ, They're not attacking that person or that fellowship. They're actually attacking the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He says that's why when they speak and revile you, rejoice in my name. Why? Because they're not saying it about you, they're saying it about me. And today in our culture, in our nation, we're pretty blessed. I I think it's going to get worse and there's going to be more, more political pressure upon Christians in my lifetime. There'll be a day that there'll be entire entities like museums, it's already happening, and public schools that will not rent their space out to Christians because those Christians are teaching against what the culture teaches as acceptable. That's coming. People will be forced to lose their jobs and lose their income if they take a stand for truth. That's already begun, even in our state. It's not just on the left coast of Los Angeles. We want to make excuses out there in crazy la-la land. Have you read the reports here in Virginia? But by and large, we're still blessed. They, they haven't arrested us yet. They, they haven't tortured us yet. They haven't killed us yet. And I pray to God that with our founding fathers and how they set up our Constitution, I pray that freedom of religion will never be challenged in this country, but I don't know. But if you are ever suffering for Jesus, whether it be a loss of a job or a loss of a promotion or the loss of a home, and you physically suffer for Jesus because someone reviles you and someone makes fun of you and someone bullies you. Realize that he is the one that is suffering. They're not rejecting you. They are rejecting the Jesus Christ in you who is the hope of glory. 
And when they attack you, they're attacking him. And so as they beat Paul, and as they stoned Paul, and as Paul was shipwrecked in the ocean over the nighttime, and as he was bitten by snakes, and he was killed by Nero, or he was locked up in prison, or he was hungry, and he was starving, and when he was cold, and when he was destitute, and when he said, I can do all things through Christ, I can go through poverty, and I can go through prosperity, Paul went through it all. But really, the one who was suffering was Jesus Christ himself. You see, the persecutors could not touch Jesus, but they could touch Paul. See, Satan cannot touch Jesus, but Satan hates Jesus so much and hates the church so much, he gives his anger against you and he attacks your marriage and your family and your body. He attacks you. Why? Because you're a little lower than the angels, the Bible says. And we've talked about the authority of the believer. We've talked about that here. That's not what this message is about. This is the other side of the coin. So when you are suffering, it's filling up the sufferings of Jesus. So what was intended for Christ, all of those injuries, they place upon you were actually placed upon him. And that's why we rejoice. I'm worthy to suffer for Christ. I am completing, I am fulfilling his affliction. I try to give you some kind of metaphor, and I didn't write this in my notes because it's, it's a little goofy, but, I, but I, I think you will get it, what I'm trying to go with. I, I'm going to take a risk here, and I think you'll get it. If you are raised in a home of boys, boys can get tough. We would shoot each other with BB guns. True story. We would shoot each other with slingshots with acorns. I love you, brother. Boom. I recall one friend getting shot at point blank range with a paintball gun right here. Boom. I love you, man. Boys can be rough and tough and tumble. Don't do that on your mother's couch. Stop it. Anyone else raising a home like that? You're all safe. You guys have helmets and you have seat belts. Yeah. But as boys, we would say some dumb things. We would put the other person down. It's because we loved them and liked them. That's what you did. You talked smack. And one of the statements was this. I am going to beat you until I kill you. Then I'm going to raise you back up and I'm going to beat you all over again. Anyone hear anything similar to that before in their lives? It's okay, you're in a safe place. I've got two people that are being honest that they heard that. Maybe it was a Kansas thing, I don't know. I know Laura Pate never heard that in her home. But she wasn't raised by wolves, all right? <laughs> but here's the point. I'm going to punish you and inflict so much pain upon you until where I can't inflict any more pain on you. And then after you're dead, I'm going to resurrect you and I'm going to do it some more. In other words, I'm going to give you as much as I can. And that's basically what Satan and the kingdom of darkness did to Jesus. Crucified him, killed him, beat him, abused him, 
He died. He won because he was resurrected and ascended. And now Satan, the king of darkness, says, I cannot get to him, so I'm going to attempt to inflict so much pain upon his people that I can. And here's what Paul says. Wow. Let me help you get it. Paul says, do not lose the moment by whining, by complaining, by saying, I don't deserve this, by saying, this isn't fair, by saying, I can't believe this is happening to me. But he says, I am going to rejoice in my sufferings. Knowing it is filling up Christ's afflictions. They're not doing it to me. They're doing it to him. Wow. Are you catching this today? If you can see that and you can get a hold of that, it'll get you from being the center of the show. Because your life is not the John Doe show or the Jane Doe show that Jesus just makes a support appearance into and he pops in a supporting role and he pops out with a miracle here and there. The story is the Jesus Christ show. He is the hero and he is the star of the show and the rest of us are nothing but supporter actors of his story. So we appear upon his stage. We appear upon his stories. And when we suffer and we're persecuted, it's because it's about his story and about who he is. And that's why we rejoice. We say, I rejoice in this because they're not persecuting me. They're persecuting Jesus. And Jesus upon the cross did not die for himself. He died for the sake of the body, for his church, that they would have life and life more abundantly. Amen? Wow, we kind of ended there on a deep theological note. Come back next week. Get back on the tour bus. And I'll be calmed down a little bit next week. And we'll finish out this tour, all right? As Tony and the team comes, would you stand as a good in, in a song of worship? And then I will come back and pronounce a blessing over you guys in just a moment. All right? Amen. 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 There we go. Amen. All right. You know what? God is good. And just like Roger was talking about, we sang this before, and I want us to sing this again. Um, We did this, it's for from him and through him and to him, amen?
did not mean to end the message on such a serious note. I want you to come back next week because I want you to hear about the grace of God and the power of God in that. But I also want to remind you this. I want to remind you that God, specifically, Jesus Christ, wastes nothing. He doesn't waste your victories. He doesn't waste your prosperity. He doesn't waste the broken relationship. He doesn't waste the demotion or the promotion. He doesn't waste the laughter and the tears. But somehow in his divine power and his divine love, behind the scenes he works his tapestry. And some of you right now, you're suffering. You're suffering in life. You're suffering in relationships. You're suffering in this life. And you just want to say, why, why, why? And as you look at the back of the tapestry, there's all kinds of knots. You ever see the tapestry when they put the threads through it? All kinds of knots. It's a mess. You're looking at the wrong side. You're looking through the eyes of the temporal. You're looking through the eyes of the now. You're looking through the eyes of the immediate. But when you turn that thing around, you get a picture of eternity and you see, wow, this is the masterpiece and this is the work of art that God is working. And at that moment, and it may not be in this life, but there'll be a moment you will stand before the Most High God and you will say, you're so good and you're so holy. I can't believe I ever doubted your hand, but I see your beautiful masterpiece. And some of you will get to see that in this life. Some of you will wait and you'll step into the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And with a smile, you'll say, now I see clearly that was nothing but shadows and darkness in this earth. Amen? In the meantime, I want to proclaim a blessing over you. Take your hands like this to receive the blessing. This is one of my favorite things we've begun the last few months. In the chapter on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after talking for 50-some verses about the resurrection, Paul says this to you. Be steadfast. Be unmovable. Always abound in the work of God, knowing that because of the resurrection, your work, your labor, is not empty nor in vain. It will bear fruit. Can you say yes to that? Amen. Amen. Turn around and look at someone and say, stand steadfast. Look at someone and say, don't move. Your life is not in vain. Amen. And without that, Pastor Tony and the team, take us out. Holy, holy is the Lord our God. He is worthy, worthy. Jesus Christ, the saving one, oh, praise his name forever and ever, amen. Oh, praise his name. Amen. God bless. We love you. Have a great week. 
from him, through him, and to him. Amen. All things. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. And the holy, the holy, holy is the Lord our God. And he's worthy, worthy. Jesus Christ, the saving one. And the holy, the holy, holy. Forever and ever, amen. Whoa.